What do you make of the lies then? You hear, you know, we've been hearing from the mainstream media that Ukraine is about to launch this ma this large offensive. Of course, we've been hearing that Russia is going to launch their offensive. So wh what's the truth here? Uh, and then as you point out in this piece, you said the growing realization that America and European military industrial capacity cannot keep up with Ukrainian demands for ammunition and equipment is an ominous signal to send during a proxy war that Washington insists its Ukrainian surrogate is winning. So we're saying that Ukraine's winning. And yet you're pointing out the realization that we can't even sustain the ammunition needed for them to fake win this war. Yeah, I mean, the Ukrainians have obliged the Russians by pouring tens of thousands of troops in eastern Ukraine into offensives over the last several months, attack after attack after attack. And this started long before uh, the fall in uh, last year, and they've lost tens of thousands of people. The most recent figures that I've seen, and they're very, very credible, suggest that there were up to about 250,000 dead Ukrainians. I mean, that's, that's a horrific number for a war that's only been going on for about a year. So how do you, how do you build new armies. I mean, there, there's, a, there's some evidence that you've had three armies literally fielded in the time that this war has taken place. The first, of course, was this professional force of about 450,000 with about 200,000 reservists. That was largely destroyed in the first six months. Then a second force was raised for mobilization. That force was destroyed in the fall, and then a third mobilization began before Christmas. And right now, it looks as though these brigades that, that entered with, say, 2,000 soldiers or 2,500 soldiers are down to about one or 200 effectives. And the, the numbers of wounded, three or 400,000, consist of people who will never return to duty. So the, the question is, what will the Ukrainians do next? And it seems that they've decided they're going to scrape together whatever they can find and once again throw it into the offensive on the assumption that if they do not attack, People will discover that, that they can't win. The Russians, of course, are in no hurry. They, they have fought the Ukrainians with a, a fraction of their force. You've got maybe 80 to 100,000 Russians who are killing uh, successive waves of Ukrainian attacks, backed by enormous artillery power, rockets, missiles, drones. I mean, this, this, is, this is warfare on the scale of World War I. And uh, the Ukrainians, unfortunately, are doing all the wrong things and bleeding themselves to death. So I, I don't think this can continue indefinitely. And I think people in Washington know the truth, even though nobody wants to tell it. Everyone continues to maintain the fiction that Ukraine is doing well and can ultimately win, that the Russians are incompetent, stupid, and can't do anything. It's all nonsense. I mean, just this morning, I, I read the, the final tallies coming in from credible sources that the Russian integrated air defenses have shot down 402 jets, 256 helicopters, thousands and thousands of unmanned aircraft, or what we call drones. So the integrated Russian air defenses have turned out to be extremely lethal and very, very effective. I, I, this war is not going well for the West, and I think President Biden and his immediate advisors do know that. The question is, how do they disengage? And that's really why I wrote this piece. And so you're hearing, I imagine from your sources in Washington, that there is this maybe movement towards wanting to get out of this thing. Um, yes. How much resolve do you think there is for that? You know, it, it's hard to tell. Uh, first of all, I, I, I hate to be blunt, but I no longer pay much attention to what the cardboard cutout called Biden says. I really don't think he's in charge. I, I think he's handed things to read and he reads them and says them in a convincing way, by the by the way, that we should not underestimate. But uh, I don't think he's in charge, but there are others who are unappointed, unelected, some are appointed, most are not. But the key thing is none of them are elected and they're running the government. You have the diehards led by Newland and her band uh, of uh, so-called neocons with Blinken in trail and, and Austin in trail and so forth. They're not going to quit they will go to the, to the last Ukrainian if it's necessary. But there are others who are saying, wait a minute, is this really what we want to happen? It's clear that uh, Schultz is in a lot of trouble in Germany. He came here to see Biden to tell him how much trouble he is in. One of the oldest metal firms in Germany, founded in 1380, a firm that survived from 1380 through the two world wars into the present, 
has just declared bankruptcy and gone under in Germany. And the reason is very simple, no energy. Right. And you have to have quantities of cheap energy to maintain your scientific industrial base. Germany is dying in that sense. The German population is furious. You can't keep this up. So how do we get out? And that's an important question. And at some point, the only way to get out is to turn to the Russians and say, no preconditions, let's talk. And I don't think that we're going to be very happy with what the Rus Russians ultimately say privately in terms of what their conditions are for an end of the war, because we will have lost everything we set out to win. Well, the numbers you just dropped on me are pretty astonishing. I hope our audience was paying attention to that, too, on the upwards of 400 jets um, and thousands of unmanned aerial vehicles and you name it. I mean, the list is endless. And are most of those coming from the West or were those Ukrainian jets? What do they have left at this point? We know the Poles are now sending in. They're proud of the fact that they're going to send in some jets for the first time. A bunch of United States congressmen are coming together saying we need to send jets to Ukraine from the United States just throwing more weapons into a, a black hole. Well, those are the wrong weapons, given the lethality of air defenses. And I think we're seeing <clears throat> the future is here, if you will. I don't want to say we're seeing the future. The future is upon us. And uh, it is a, a future in which manned aircraft and even unmanned aircraft are going to be at very high risk in any war. If, if the opponent has the kind of air defense technology and radar arrays that the Russians have. The, the Russians, of course, came out of World War II with the understanding that they needed integrated, overlapping air defenses. Uh, we never came out of the war that way. We came out of the war with the assumption that if we build enough fighter aircraft, we could defeat anybody. Well, that's changed. And uh, those aircraft were flown by Ukrainians, and they were all lost. The same thing with helicopters. Now, the Russians have lost some, too, but a fraction of what, what the Ukrainians have lost. And the Russians do have the ability right now to, to launch close air support missions because there's nothing up there to stop them. And the Ukrainian air defenses have been largely demolished. All of these missile attacks that you've heard about week after week after week have been aimed at very specific targets. They have not been aimed at the civilian populations. They've been aimed at stripping away and destroying any air defense capability that exists in Ukraine, number one. Number two, aimed at the energy grids the transfer of power, stopping the rail lines, stopping heating, all these kinds of things, making life obviously miserable. Those have been the top priority targets and then command and control and all the usual military targets. It all worked. And the Russians have built up their forces right now to a point where they're ready to go. The, the point is that they didn't go in January because the ground simply did not freeze enough. Remember, we've got 10 to 15 feet of black earth in eastern Ukraine. I mean, this black earth is wonderful stuff. It's so fertile. I mean, a Russian told me one day, just stick a, stick a, a, a stone and a, uh, you know, a log into it and stuff grows. It's that fertile. <laughs> During World War II, the Germans loaded up rail cars with the black earth and shipped it back to Germany to improve the fertility of German soil. I mean, this is some of the most fertile territory in the entire world. The problem is it's 10 to 15 feet, some places even deeper. You drive off the road now and you sink like a rock into mud. It has to dry out. So what the Russians have been doing is essentially inviting the Ukrainians into what they call fire traps. By all means, attack in Bakhmut. Just march on in there with thousands of men and then we'll annihilate you in, in an encirclement. But they always leave a road open so that the, the few survivors can get out, or if they're stupid enough, they'll send in more soldiers. Ukrainians continue to send in more soldiers. Now, Bakhmut is important as a logistical hub, a rail hub, for all sorts of reasons. This is the, the last remnant of the Ukrainian defense of the Donbass, what we used to call the Donetsk Basin. That's quite clear. And if they lose that, then they're effectively, they've got behind them nothing but rolling open terrain all the way up to the, the river and Kiev. So they'll have to fall back. They know that. They want to hold on to this, understand, but it's cost them far too many lives. And at some point, you have to do what the Russians did early in the war. Remember, we had this, uh, had all these claims of Ukrainian victory around Kharkov. Look, Ukrainians advanced 100 kilometers and the Russians put up no resistance. Well. That wasn't entirely true, but 
The Russians decided it was just open, flat terrain of no real strategic value. They could win it back later, so they said, we'll economize, pull those forces out, and we'll use them where we can defend more easily. The same thing down at Hersot. Those weren't defeats. Those were deliberate decisions to give up ground that was of no value. And the, the point is that the Russians are currently sitting on the territory that produces 90% of Ukrainian GNP. There's, a, there's no hurry right now. Right. Let the Ukrainians defend themselves. And at some point, probably in May or June, when the, when the ground really dries out, because they're still having rains out there in eastern and southern Ukraine, when it dries out, they'll move. I was trying to get people to understand why are we waiting for this inevitable hammer to fall? The Ukrainians are in desperate conditions, desperate shape. Let's have talks now and rescue what we can. But I think it's, it's a big struggle inside the administration and on the Hill. And you have people like Lindsey Graham saying, oh no, let's shoot down Russian aircraft. Let's widen the war. Let's kill more people. <laughs> the New York Times and the Washington Post over the last 72, 96 hours who printed articles where the truth is hidden in the articles. Ukrainians are exhausted. They've, lo they've suffered horrific losses. You know, it, it paints a very grim picture. And I, I think there's also a movement to sort of gradually condition Americans to the inevitability of the Ukraine's loss in the hopes that it will soften the blow when it finally comes. But my, my concern is with this radical fringe that has really been running the show in the administration. These are your radical globalists. The radicals are trying to force CRT down our throats here at home. They want to keep the borders open. They're trying to perpetuate rather than shut down criminality in our, in our cities. These are the same people that are happy to commit us to an all-out war with Russia. These people have to be brought under control. They're not Democrats, you know. Right. And I don't think Rubio and, and Lindsey Graham, frankly, qualify as Republicans. It's a lot of nonsense. Historically, Republicans have not stood for any of this warmonger. So we're in a lot of trouble in Washington. And the good news is that DeSantis at least had the common sense to say, no, it is not a vital strategic interest of the United States to become involved in Eastern Ukraine. Trump has said that for a very long time. Trump was always opposed to any conflict of any kind with Russia or China because it's not necessary. If you want to fight a war on the economic level, in other words, not a war, but you're, you're conflicted, then you can do what Trump wanted to do with China. Don't trade with them. Right. If you can't trade on an equitable basis, don't trade. Sounds reasonable to me. But this unrelenting war against Russia on every level, economic, financial, military, it's very dangerous. And the Russians are mobilized. They're ready to fight. We're not ready to fight anyone. Let's be frank, we can't even recruit for the armed forces.